is they're composable. So I can build higher level web components by composing uh, more fine-grained web components. And uh, this is very different than my experience with using um, server-side MVC frameworks that just give me like helper methods. If you've tried to build a, um, you know, a helper method in something like Rails or JSP or that's composed out of other helper methods, it really gets terrible really quickly. Uh, and the reason for that is if you think of those things, um, you're really talking about trying to, uh, you end up basically building up strings of HTML that intersperse calls to more fine-grade helper methods, and that kind of approach is really terrible to do. Uh, but there are pieces of um, web components, the way they work, that allow, it, uh, that allow you to, to compose components together and build higher level components in a way that's a lot more powerful. Um, and the other thing that I really like about component-oriented frameworks is that HTML is the templating language. Rather than using a separate programming language, I can take the HTML and CSS a designer produces uh, declare where my components manage sections of that HTML and, and continue iterating on that original HTML with the designer. And, and that's a really, really fun way to build a web app if you're working with uh, a design team. Uh, so all th the other, the thing that's awesome about component-oriented frameworks that kind of uh, is a natural thing that happens with a successful component-oriented framework. When you're able to easily com to build up more rich components out of more fine-grade components, what happens uh, if a framework is successful is you end up with ecosystems of open source components. So uh, the original uh, framework might ship with, you know, for example, a um, low-level components like text field and text area and so on and so forth, the kind of basics that you need. And what will happen if, if the framework su is successful, uh, the open source community will produce much more rich components based on those. For example, a data grid component that uses the text field and text area and so on and so forth. And that just kind of happens naturally and you end up with a uh, ecosystem where by the time as a developer you need to do something, there's a really good chance that somebody else in the community has given you a good place to start. And that's, in my experience, I, I really um, find that to be awesome and, um, you know, very powerful and, and lets me build apps much more quickly. And I like that. Um, so, oh yeah, what I was doing with this slide. Yeah, so server-side frameworks, as we know, um, didn't really, server-side component frameworks um, are no longer, uh, I would say, even the presence of web app development. And that's really comes down to um, we're moving more and more of the web app behavior into the client. And that's really um, of necessity to kind of provide the user experience that we want to provide. This is kind of an unstoppable trend, in, in my opinion, that um, the web application is going to the client. That's where we can actually provide the kind of rich interactive experience that we want to provide. Uh, so where does that leave us? So server-side component frameworks um, were really interesting, but um, I would say they're no longer the present because you know, trying to manage a rich component where I'm doing a request response cycle with every user interaction uh, just ultimately breaks down in this new era of, you know, Ajax requests going back and forth. So um, I think I'm going to kind of whip through this section on, um, on Angular. Um, I kind of see that as the prime example of component-oriented frameworks today. Um, but really, they kind of start with this idea of what if we could have components in the browser instead of on the server side? What would that look like? And what if we could actually, you know, bend HTML to our will. So very early on, when I first started working with HTML as a developer, way back in the 90s when HTML was like a, a new thing, uh, as a developer, one of my first questions was, OK, this is great, all these you know, out-of-the-box HTML tags, but 
what if I want to write my own? You know, how do I do that? And the answer to that question for a long time was, too bad you can't. And um, y that's no longer the case. We can now, as developers, actually extend HTML itself to provide the, um, the kind of semantics that are more appropriate for our application. Uh, and that's one of the things I'm going to talk about, this kind of the main uh, example that I'll go through in this presentation. Um, but the other thing that's interesting is what if we could bind plain old JavaScripts to plain old HTML? And uh, Angular um, actually allows us to do both of those things. Uh, it provides two-way binding out of the box. Uh, components in Angular map onto directives. If you've done any Angular directives, that basically is a web component. And a lot of the, um, the web component specs, uh, a lot of the ideas were driven from Angular, uh, other web frameworks as well, but uh, certainly a lot of them, you can really see a direct lineage between what's going on with the web component spec and what Angular did. Um, and web components in Angular can map onto elements, attributes, or classes. Um, and I have a really um, brief example to go through. So um, does anybody, was anybody doing HTML long enough to remember the blink tag? Long enough ago to remember the blink tag. So um, you're really sad when it went away, if that's true, I'm sure. So what I'm about to show you is the reincarnation of the blink tag. Uh, so, this is the HTML for the app, and I've added the blink tag, and so that foo is blinking. Um, however, I've extended the blink tag now to be able to specify the interval that I want to blink, and I'm binding this interval property of my blink tag to uh, an interval of the interval property um, of my model, which in this case is just a simple uh, number property. And I have the input tag over here bound to that same interval property of my model so that I can go in and if I change this, it will slow down my blinking or speed it up if I want to blink really fast. You probably can't even see that anymore. Um, so this is kind of the key ideas of um, web components in a very small nutshell. I'm defining my own HTML to specify what I to, to specify how I want it to work. And uh, I'm binding between an input tag and my um, directive or component. Um, I'm not going to try to go through all of this code. Um, I want to have more time to cover the, um, the more um, the more future stuff, the specs that are coming along in HTML that will let you do the same thing. Um, but you can probably make sense of it just by looking at it briefly. Uh, I have the um, controller here is the main thing that's actually implementing the logic. I have a show element and hide element. And uh, I'm basically using a timeout service of Angular that basically specifies uh, how long to wait between blinks, more or less. I have a question. Yeah, yeah. Topic, why are you using control over a um, I think you could probably do the same thing with a link. Is there really, if there's no bonus to one or the other? Um, I can't think of one here, to be honest with you. I think it would probably have worked exactly the same way with the link. So the Angular, as so I mentioned earlier, this idea of ecosystems springing up uh, to build more rich components out of more lower level components. And this is definitely uh, happening with Angular. If you look at uh, ngmodules.org is my favorite go-to site, um, chances are good that if you have um, you know, some more common behavior that you want to implement in your Angular app, Somebody's probably already written a directive to do it for you. Um, early on, a couple examples I ran across are like simple type ahead components. That's pretty easy, but Angular has that covered. Um, but 
you know, even more complex things like, um, well, Ajax file upload, that's right here. Um, being able to do client side uploads uh, with Ajax, uh, that can be really tedious to code yourself, but Angular makes that really easy to do with a built in directive. I don't think they did. I should actually put my blink tag out there at ngmodules.org. That's good advice, Joe. Thank you. If you could also implement the marquee tag. Ooh, you, you are so right. Oh, yeah, I was going to show an example of a more um, richer Angular component just to kind of sh show this idea. So this is like towards the other end of the spectrum. And that's still loading. Yeah. Well, I don't want to sit there and watch that spin, but it's just a really fancy grid component. If you've seen other grid components, um, it's not super new. But let's really dive into where I want to spend most of my time, and that is in the future of web components. Um, and so Angular kind of implemented this idea uh, of being able to define your own custom elements and so forth as Angular directives. Um, but this idea of being able to do that um, really was, was more interesting in terms of what if we could take those ideas and bring them back into the browser? What if the browser itself could expose an API for letting you write your own custom elements outside of having to use a framework like Angular? And um, so this has started to happen. And uh, if you go out to W3C and look at the web components spec, uh, you can actually see this developing right now. Uh, the web component spec is more of a spec of specs. So we'll go through those individually. Um, but you know, what we're talking about in this spec of specs are basically four main specs um, that work together to allow you to build uh, components in the browser without having to use a separate framework. Um, and these web component specs um, are, are followed with great interest by the um, web component frameworks or the, uh, the web MVC, the client side MVC frameworks that are popular right now. So both Angular and Ember, for example, have um, committed to getting behind these and actually um, as these become um, more fully adopted by all the browsers, bringing them back in. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not as sure about the Ember plans, but I know they've they've talked about supporting it, and Angular's definitely all over it as well. Um, but let's go through these one at a time and talk about them. Um, the first spec to talk about is templates, and templates basically are a standard. Uh, approach for client-side templating. So as we start to build um, build more in the client side, uh, it used to be that we were rendering templates on the server side. And now as we actually are building more behavior on the client side, there's a need to be able to have our templates rendered client-side by our client-side framework. And previously, the way that we had to do that was either um, have a bunch of uh, have template compiled into JavaScript on the server somewhere and sent down to us so that we could evaluate it as a function, or else um, using script tags with markup in it uh, on the client side. And both of those were really kind of awkward approaches. And the template spec actually gives us a new element at the HTML level to represent this idea of a template. And a template basically can hold any kind of markup, and it's just inert. So this doesn't render anywhere in the DOM right away. I stick a template in my HTML. I give it an ID so I can access it. And inside of that, I just have whatever markup that I want. Uh, and as we'll see later, uh, this can be anything that's HTML, including styling and JavaScript and, and the whole shebang. Um, and what I do with that template is 
to actually um, make use of the template in my application is I, I grab it and then I populate it by just basically going in and you know filling in the bits that I want. So in this example, uh, I have an add comment function that uses my comment template over here. And the first thing I'm doing here is I'm grabbing that template just by its ID. And then the next thing I'm doing is cloning it. So I, uh, I access my template, and then I instantiate it by cloning it, basically. And then I'm filling in the bits I want to fill in just by DOM manipulation. So um, pretty simple. Uh, I'm just grabbing that image, uh, grabbing the image from within my content template and setting its source and filling in the, uh, the text of the comment as well. And then I take my cloned template and I just append it to the body. So um, we'll see this actually get used in a more complex example in a minute, but any questions on the idea of templates and what they're doing? Okay, cool. So uh, the shadow DOM is the next, uh, it's probably the most complex spec in this whole spec of specs, but the idea of it is really powerful. And what it's about is giving you like an encapsulation uh, level for HTML and CSS. So um, one of the most fascinating things about the Shadow DOM is it's actually something that was already there that the browsers were using, at least in the case of Chrome. It's basically just exposing APIs that browser developers already were using. Uh, and if you think about it, like HTML5 has introduced a lot of new tags. And um, so the Shadow DOM is actually the mechanism that a lot of those tags are actually implemented. But now we have access to that same API to be able to write our own custom tags. And we'll see that here in a minute. But to show what I'm talking about with uh, what I mean by exposing APIs that are already there in the browser, uh, if I go out to this example, here's a page where we have uh, a bunch of, the, well, most of the um, HTML5 uh, tags here that are new. And if you go into Chrome right now, um, in the web inspector, I don't know, it might be on by default now, I don't remember. But there's the show shadow DOM. And it used to just be called show shadow DOM, but I guess it's called this now. And what this will do is if I'm looking at one of these elements over here now, if I go and expand that guy, I now see this shadow root thing over here. And this will actually let me go and see the HTML markup that actually implements that slider tag in HTML5. Um, the same with all these down here. I can look at this meter guy and see that in the DOM, it's just a meter element over here. But if I look at its shadow root, I actually see how the browser is implementing it. And if I go far enough down, I can see that there's a little div there who's with this 60%, which corresponds to this 0.6 over here. So this internal shadow DOM is not by default accessible from the outside. It's like you know, if there's a level of separation between um, that internal uh, DOM representation and the external DOM that, that is the actual document itself. Um, and so, you know, you can have entire control of exactly how your element looks and works with no uh, interference from the outside document. And that's a pretty powerful thing. It used to be that you know, if you wanted to have something that produced a bunch of HTML, you were, if, and if there was something that happened to style that element from the rest of the document, you, know, you kind of lost control over exactly how your element was going to look. 
Shadow DOM gives you the ability to have more fine-grained control. So making your own Shadow DOM is really, really easy if you're using a browser that actually supports this. But just to point out, I am running this entire presentation in Chrome Canary. So that is like bleeding edge Chrome. Like it's, it's not even released a version of Chrome. So these APIs are definitely, you know, undergoing change and development and evolution and not supported by all the browsers today yet, unfortunately. Um, but I think they're worth looking at because they're definitely coming. And so let's look at this example of creating our own Shadow DOM. Um, basically, it's just as simple as grabbing your element and calling this create shadow root method. And this create shadow root is itself, that is the shadow DOM, the shadow document, if you will. And this is what this looks like in an actual concrete example. So I have this document over here. I have a div with ID thing. And we see it saying something here. This is the content inside this div. But then in my JavaScript, I'm accessing this div and I'm creating a shadow root. And I'm setting the inner HTML of my shadow root to h1 something. And what we see happening is that it's the shadow root is overshadowing the previous content inside that element. So that's definitely something to be aware of in terms of how the shadow DOM works. Uh, it, you know, when you create a shadow root, it will overshadow what was ever in there previously. And um, we'll talk about in a minute how you could actually get to this content inside and decide what to do with it. Um, but by default, if you create a shadow DOM on an element, it trumps whatever was in there previously. Just to show you what I mean. So just to make it clear that it's definitely the shadow DOM that's rendering and not the content that was in there previously. So um, any questions on the shadow DOM before I go on to the next bit? What's that? When we put it all together, I, I guess the basic idea of Shadow DOM and why it's useful is it allows you to um, have a level of separation between uh, the content of what we'll see in a minute as our custom element and the surrounding document. Yep. separate it out and like name that CSS something in particular and it would work outside of the regular CSS files that are loaded in the document. Yeah. We'll s when I get to the full example of how all these specs fit together, I think it, the usefulness of the Shadow DOM will be a little bit more obvious, I hope. If it's not, okay. save up your questions and ask them again. Okay. I just want to show you what the Shadow DOM is so that you, when you see the whole example that uses all these pieces together, It'll make sense. Um, but the other thing that Shadow DOM lets you do, I mentioned in the previous example, by default, it overshadows what was the content that was in there already. But there is a mechanism to be able to get to that content and choose how you want to render it. And that mechanism is called content selectors. The idea uh, of you know, taking your content that was there previously and doing something with this. Um, there's a word called transclusion that the Angular community uh, came up with and uh, gets made fun of quite frequently by other frameworks as an example of complexity. But uh, it turns out uh, it's actually not a new word. Uh, it's just a word for being able to um, access um, the inside of your, your content and do something with it. Um, and it lets you separate completely the content that you're passed from your presentation. So you can define, as you'll see, you can define where to render the content inside of your tag using this idea. 
Um, and it lets you pull out chunks from the original subtree, your original content, to put it in the shadow DOM. And you can specify what exactly you're trying to pull out with the select attribute. And let's see an example that will hopefully make this click a little bit better. Um, yeah, OK. So now I have a much more complex example here. And let's go through this a little bit at a time. So this is going to bring together the shadow DOM, the content selector, and the template idea into something that approaches usefulness. So let's break this down a little bit at a time. Um, we have our template element up here with ID of name <coughs> tag template. And then inside of our template, we have a block of styling for what we want to go on here. And then the rest of our template, we actually are just structuring our content. We have an outer div, a top div that we'll see. And in here, this content, this is how we specify where we want our previous content to actually go in our rendered content. So the way this works, I have this div with ID name tag and content code Q mash. I get to this name tag div over here and to create a shadow root for it. I then grab my template over here, this name tag template, that has all this stuff, including this content element over here. And I tell my shadow DOM to append a new child with my cloned template. And this content element here basically says the original content that was here already, it goes here. So all these specs kind of cooperate. And that's why, you know, there's so much apparent complexity going on is that all these pieces fit together to be able to do the final product, if you will. So um, that content, the way I'm using it right here, it basically just says whatever content was there, just grab the whole thing and put it here. If I wanted to, I could be more selective than that. I could say something like span code. And I could say, I hope I get this right. Select equals span. And that would let me pull out just this one span element. And this can be any legal CSS selector over here. It's like a query selector? Yeah. So, and I could have more than one of these. I could say I want to take this sub piece of my content and put it over here, this other piece of my content and put it over here. So it allows me really fine-grained control over what my originally content was and how I want it to appear in the output of rendering my template. So let me go back to what it was before. Uh, oh, yeah, I got to get rid of that too. So by default, the net effect of all this is I have this fancy name badge over here where I have this hi my name at is up top and then the body here which just renders my content which in this case is code Q mash but I could change to since CJS so 
head explode or make sense or can uh, anybody got any specific questions that I can Um, the shadow root is important because it gives me a level of separation between what I'm doing inside of this guy and the surrounding dom. So it lets me get precise control over how I want it to look. And to see what I mean, uh, if in my main document, for example, I had another div... So you, you see here where I'm styling name, and I'm saying um, the background is white, the color is black, all this. If I do another guy over here with class equals name, as you can see, it's completely unaffected by the style sheet in that template. And that goes both ways. I can have my own style section in my main document. And now I could like say I want name to be what? Uh, background color? Sorry, I don't do enough color. Blue? So I have the background color blue in my surrounding document. It has no effect on the name class that I'm using over here inside my document. And that's what the shadow DOM does in a nutshell. It lets me give, get precise control over the visual appearance of my, my component. I know this question is probably, uh, Oh, yeah, I, it doesn't matter. Go ahead. Do you have shadow DOMs inside of shadow DOMs? Ooh. Yes, but that is above my level of ability to talk about. I'm sorry. The shadow DOM spec itself, I am not trying to cover all of the shadow DOM because it gets really uh, quite complicated. The other thing that you can do is define things in your shadow DOM that you want to be able to style from the outside. And you can define like interface points, if you will, so that, well, I want to be able to override the styling of just this bit of my internal content, things like that. But yes, I'm pretty sure shadow DOMs can have shadow DOMs, and I don't know any more than that. So, so my question was, I, I, I mean, you know you already covered, kind of covered this, but I, I just want to pose it anyway. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to do anything close to this uh, as, dumb browser, as other dumb browsers? Yes, we'll get to that at the very end. Oh. Um, there's to cut to the chase, check out Polymer. Polymer is a set of polyfills that implements most of this stuff in the very modernist of browsers, as in IE10 and the other ones. And that's, that's, the money. that's as close as you can get. And Polymer is like alpha. Anyway, we'll see Polymer in a little bit. But that's a good question. Um, so. Last but certainly not le least, let's start to look at like what this actually, bringing this all together. And bringing this all together is um, being able to use this stuff uh, in your own custom, custom element. So we saw the directive definition in Angular earlier. This is what it looks like to define your own custom elements using the HTML five custom element APIs that are going to be built into your browser soon. Um, it's actually, I think, quite a bit simpler. You make uh, a new tag by calling document.registerElement. Custom elements must have a dash in their um, name. And that is so that the browser can differentiate built-in elements from custom elements. Yeah. Would this particular issue arise for um, uh, IE8 browsers? Like they, like I know, I know the latest build of Angular doesn't support IE8, but like if you go back one or two versions, it does. Like oh, there, like, custom elements. I mean, this is what I'm dis displaying here is like the new um, HTML5 custom element API. Oh. This is like not even in okay. any IE, probably quite yet, um, but. If it proceeds as it normally does, 
w as the W3C continues to standardize this, uh, you know, hopefully IE will follow suit like they generally have and actually implement it. Well, at least when they do, you'll now get it with because IE 11 is like evergreen, right? That's what I've heard. All the major browsers are now evergreen. They're self-updating. So when the spec is fully baked, um, you know, if the new Microsoft continues to be consistent th with the way it's acting, they'll bring this in and it'll be there. Um, so back to what I was talking about. So defining a custom element lets you, in your document, use your tag. But so far, it does exactly nothing at all. It just means you can use this tag as in your document, and it'll be there in the DOM. Yay. But what lets you actually take that custom element and turn it into something useful are uh, these lifecycle callbacks. Uh, and they are methods on the prototype of your custom element, which we'll see how to create in a second. Uh, some of them that we'll, that we'll use, well, really only one that we'll use in the example is created callback. Uh, but created callback basically just uh, is what the, the um, browser will invoke when you're a new instance of your custom element is actually created. Uh, attached and detached will fire when your custom element is attached or detached from the DOM. Uh, attribute changed is to be able to listen to attributes on your custom element. Custom elements can have attributes. So with that information, let's actually look at another example and start seeing how all these building blocks kind of fit together even more. Um, we have the exact same element, we have the exact same example we just saw a second ago, but with one key difference. Instead of having this div ID whatever and then explicitly monkeying with it in JavaScript, we're just using our name badge, name dash badge custom element that we'll be defining in the JavaScript. So what this looks like, and I'm going to hide this output so I get a little bit more space and my JavaScript looks a little bit less wonky. The first thing I do is I create a prototype for my uh, custom element. Um, and so it's worth pointing out, um, I don't think I saw in my earlier slides what this looks like. I can specify a prototype for my custom element uh, by passing in passing it into the call to register element. Uh, it must extend in some way from HTML element dot prototype. So, and if I say nothing at all, it will just be HTML element dot prototype. So, I'm making a name badge prototype by explicitly extending from HTML element dot prototype, which I do by calling object dot create, uh, and then on my name badge prototype, I'm defining one method a created callback. This created callback will be invoked when my name badge over here is instantiated. And inside of that created callback is now where I've moved my code to create my shadow DOM, except instead of you know, grabbing an element on the page and creating a shadow, do, do, a shadow DOM root, uh, I'm creating a shadow DOM on myself, which I do by this. So inside of um, you know, a uh, prototype method, this, of course, is the object. And in this case, it is this name badge element. So I'm creating a shadow root on this name badge element itself. I'm accessing my template the same way I would before just by grabbing its ID. And then uh, a pen child is the same thing we saw before. So I, uh, slowly, it's becoming less and less code that I have to do, and um, more and more encapsulated. At least that's the idea. Yes? How, how does that then, maybe this is your next slide, how does this get packaged 
that is my next slide. You are exactly right. I will give you 10 bucks later for that. Perfect. OK, cool. It's like we've been working together for how many years? Very long time. So how does this get packaged together, the man in the back asks. And the answer to that question is HTML imports. HTML imports allow you to import a document into another. And um, I don't know, the kind of the way that you, they usually introduce this idea is they talk about, well, for a long time we've you know, had the ability to bring in style sheets and JavaScript, but we can't bring in HTML from one document to another really cleanly. And uh, HTML imports allow us to do that. Uh, and that document that we're importing itself can have anything an HTML document can have. It can have HTML, but it can also include CSS and JavaScript of its own. Um, and it's important to note that when I import a document, the JavaScript inside script tags in there will execute, but that HTML is not rendered anywhere by default. So if I'm importing HTML into my document, it's not just like including a bunch of HTML and plopping it in there. It's basically bringing it in, but it's still up to me to use it as um, you know the uh, somewhere in the in the surrounding document. I have to explicitly make use of it if that makes sense. Um, but it turns out it's perfect for bundling custom elements, and we'll see why here in a second. So in terms of what it actually looks like, it's just using the standard link tag, but we've added a new type of a rel. So instead of link rel equals style sheet, we have link rel equals import. And then our href points at the document that we want to import. Yes. I think, yeah, boy, I don't remember the answer to that question, Doug, off the top of my head. Um, there, it does talk about when exactly in terms of the document ready lifecycle and all that. Um, but let's see the example and see if that clarifies it enough. If not, I just have to refer you to the spec that talks about it in more detail. Do you happen to know, Kevin? Well, I don't know. Oh, okay. But I was wondering, can, pack, I mean, can you package up tons of components and then have them save the extra round trip, like, like just including, like, the other imports? Yes, yes. Imports can do other imports. And if they're, like, it will only do each import once if you happen to have, like, you know, the same import referenced by other imports. So if you have a whole collection of components, you can do that as a single import. And if you're bringing in two collections and they happen to reference the same thing, it will totally figure that out and deal with it correctly and not try to get stuck in an infinite loop of imports or do the same import twice or anything like that. So let's now put it together, er, er. Even harder. So uh, what I've done now is actually made a local um, example rather than using JSBin. And we'll see why in a second. So if I look at the source for my document, this is, entire, this is the entire source of this document now at this point. I have no extra JavaScript to tell my document explicitly how my name badge has to work or definition of my name badge. It's all uh, moved out into my imported name badge document over here. So in my head, I just have this link rel equals import. And in my document, I just use my name badge tag. And that produces my shadow DOM over here and so on and so forth. Go ahead. Oh, if I go in. So, 
So yeah, it'll give me, this is actually the, the subtree over here. I was going to go and look at it in the editor here and show you what's going on on that guy. But yeah, you can get to it here in your inspector as well. Um, I was going to. Where did Adam go? So this name badge example, that's what we saw actually in the browser. But now let's go look at the name badge definition itself. So this name badge definition, the thing that I am importing, looks like this. I have my template that's exactly the same thing we saw earlier, so I'm not going to go into that. Everything here is the same. But we are now defining a scripts tag inside of our imported document, and it looks a little bit different. So we'll talk about that. This script tag is executed as soon as my document is imported. Um, but it's Im important to understand the definition of document inside of uh, an imported document is a little bit different. Um, by default, document, if I were to just access document here in my imported document, it will be the document that I'm imported into. And that's not necessarily what I want. And it's definitely not what I want here. So I need to do a little bit of extra work to get to um, the document of the, the import doc is what I'm calling it, the actual owner document of this script. So this is how I do this. I have an API to do it. I call document, but then I call current script that owner document. And that means the document that this script is in. And that, uh, I need to be able to do that so that um, I can actually access that template over here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get to it. Let me get rid of that silly notification over here. So I grab my import doc because I'm going to use it in a minute. And then my name badge prototype, this is exactly the same as we saw before. Uh, the only difference is I need to get my to my template from the import doc. I can't call document here. It has to be import doc because I have to do that business over here. The rest of it's all exactly the same as the previous example. So that's kind of the whole vision, I guess, of all these specs and how they fit together and let us package up really arbitrarily complex components in the form of custom element tags. Uh, so none of this stuff has used any uh, external JavaScript framework at all. Uh, there are no, I, I have no jQuery even, I have no nothing. Just straight up uh, DOM APIs. Yeah. I could do that just by style. Link rel equals source, same as I would any other way. All right. Any questions on this example? Cool. So um, somebody asked the question about, can I actually start using this stuff any sooner than waiting for all the browsers to adopt these HTML5 custom element specs? And the answer is you can, kind of. And uh, Polymer is the project that's it's a, another Google open source project. Uh, and Polymer is all about uh, polyfills for these specs, and even in some cases what they call polyfills for things that they think we're going to need but actually haven't um, entered or finalized the spec process through W3C. Uh, so the specs that we've seen uh, are supported already. And this is kind of what the architecture of Polymer looks like. It's um, kind of building on layers. And um, these uh, foundational layers are where, they've implement, where they're implementing polyfills as needed. And then the idea is, as your browser actually uh, implements specs, they don't need polyfills as much anymore. So 
things like custom elements, HTML imports, uh, Shadow DOM, these things that we've seen. Uh, if your browser doesn't support it yet, Polymer will give you a polyfill for that. And it's mostly pretty. Go ahead. It's magic. <laughs> Hand wavy. Like, like styles you're not going to like scope styles and all that stuff, right? Um, I can show you an example and we can see how close it is. But in terms of the details of how they implement all that stuff, I don't know the answer to all those. It's voodoo. That's why I wave my hands to show that it's awesome and don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah let's, let's look. There are some slight differences. Um, and when I say let's see some, so at this point it's worth pointing out that I now have to go over to Google Chrome to actually be able to see the Polymer examples. So I don't know what uh, is going on in uh, Chrome Canary that's stepping on something Polymer is trying to do, but there is. So um, what I'm going to do now is actually look at a example. Uh, well, let me first go over to components. I think it's components IO. Did I get that wrong? No, that's totally not right. Oh, no, custom, custom elements.io. So there's actually a pretty big um, set of Polymer components out there that you can actually look at. Um, Polymer is definitely alpha and evolving really, really quickly. And some of these examples that, for example, I was using this Google Maps example, which was really cool uh, in an earlier demo I was doing. And it no longer seems to work at all right now. So you'll definitely find that happening. Polymers in rapid evolution. If an example hasn't been touched for a few months, it might not work with the current version of Polymer. Um, but we're what we're going to look at here is uh, a little markdown element that somebody's created in Polymer. And here's what it looks like. It gives you a text area that will let you do stuff in markdown. You know. And that will live convert it into rendered markdown over here. And if I look at the source for this guy, I see what I get is a markdown, a markdown element that takes whatever's inside of it and converts it into rendered markdown. And I have another custom element over here called a markdown editor, which will let me live preview markdown in an editor. So these are two Polymer custom elements. That font is probably too small. Are you guys able to read that at all? Should I make that bigger? This is actually the example that we're looking at over here. Um, we'll see that I actually have this link rel equals import. So this is basically using the same syntax for HTML5 imports. And it's using it you know, through polyfills. I'm using a custom element here and here. And this is actually, you know, I have to include um, the polymer. And here's where I'm actually bringing in the definition of my polymer element. And let's see. If we look at, this is actually the definition of the element itself. It does look a bit different than, um, than what we saw in our earlier examples. Uh, I'm using this polymer element element to define my custom element. And I have the template actually inside of my polymer element. And then rather, 
Yeah. And I'm defining two of them. I have a markdown polymer element. I'm not me. This guy is defining two of them. A markdown and a markner, markdown editor. Um, I believe it like inherits stuff from Markdown, but I'm trying to understand exactly what. Huh. Part equals Markdown, part equals Markup. This is definitely something just from Polymer. But this whole definition of markdown and ready and text changed, this all c must come from markdown itself, because I'm not defining that in here. So I mean, polymers, uh, you know, they, they're definitely clear about the fact that they're alpha. They're not trying to support older browsers. Um, IE 10, they might have even, I don't know, if IE 11 is released, maybe they've even said that's where they're starting from. They're definitely not trying to um, backfill older browsers. They're just trying to backfill modern browsers in the three major contenders. So yeah, I think that's more questions. That's pretty much the meat of my material. It's um, awesome stuff. It's still a little ways off, but not too far. And it's worth getting familiar with it now, because I think this is how we're going to be doing a lot of client-side web apps here in the near-ish future. Do you know what <coughs> the current state of the spec is and how far away? I don't. Yeah, I <coughs> probably should have. looked at that. Um, I mean, it's very, the spec itself is quite readable, but I don't think the spec itself, it's a public working draft. And uh, yeah, it's actually, so the draft hasn't changed since May. So that's somewhat stable, but this document, this kind of master spec document references the other specs. And what you would need to look for is, you know, who supported. Nobody supports all of them. You'd have to look at the individual specs like Shadow DOM and uh, HTML imports and custom elements to see which browsers support which subset of the overall spec of specs. Um, Certainly, Firefox and Chrome are the farthest along, as you might guess. But even there, nobody supports everything other than Chrome Canary. And even in Chrome Canary, I think I probably had to enable a few f experimental flags to get it to work. Um, oh, this is, is this? Oh. This is not even what I wanted to look at. Sorry. I was confused because I was looking at the wrong document. This is what I'm talking about, the web components spec of specs. So custom elements is actually a sub spec of web components. So all of these guys, templates, custom elements, shadow DOM, and imports. They're the individual bits that you would look to see which browser support which bits of. Anyway, that's about all I know. Other questions? OK, cool. I'm done. Thanks.